Voilà. Mesdames et messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor as the, uh, uh, the one who runs, <laughs> because the titles are a little ronflant, so instead of saying the executive director of uh, Vicky, the Mon Institute of uh, Community uh, International Involvement, I'm very happy to have you here. This uh, idea uh, started like all the ideas that come from uh, Sandy. Eric, Eric, we have to do a summit. <laughs> we have to do a summit because, you know, peace needs people to talk to each other, people to people connections. Something that we started in Cuba since I've met her. And then and, and with the actual current context, political context, it was very important to remind people that Vermont and Burlington is the only, if not, I mean, I think the first, if only, if not the only city in the U.S. that has a, uh, uh, you know, a tripartite connection, sister cityhood with uh, Arad, uh, Bethlehem, and then uh, people don't know about it. So uh, this is how we had that idea to create that summit, which maybe will become you know, uh, next year and the years to come, uh, a gathering, an official gathering that will be endorsed by the city and that will bring uh, people from across the planet with whom we have connection, with whom we can uh, create these bridges toward a better world. So I won't be long. One of the artisans of this uh, 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 detente from below uh, connections with uh, people around the world is Peter Claver, former mayor of uh, uh, Burlington. So without any further ado, I would like Peter to come for his uh, um, keynote speech. He will, uh, as I said in the agenda, he will deliver you know, a speech that will underscore the historical significance of the Sister City Movement and uh, its impact uh, on uh, Burlington. So please uh, welcome uh, to this podium, Peter Claven. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. It's not quite going to be a keynote, but I'm going to say a few words and we'll put things in perspective. You know, I know uh, many of you from a long time. Some of you not so well. So to help put my remarks in context, let me just describe a little bit where I'm coming from. Some of you were involved in the campaign that led to the election of Bernie Sanders. I was not. I was living in Wolnowski at the time, but shortly after Bernie was elected, I crossed the river, moved to Burlington, and began to work in his administration initially as a volunteer. At that time, as Steve Goodkind and others will attest, the Board of Aldermen, now called the City Council, refused to approve his mayoral appointees. So many, much of the work being done, including the preparation of the city's budget, was being done by volunteers. But I went on to serve as Bernie's personnel director for a brief period of time. There was a vacancy, and it was one of the few positions that he had the opportunity to fill because of the vacancy. I then went on to serve as the director of the Community and Economic Development Office for about seven years. And that was an office that was created in 1983. And then when Bernie left the mayor's office in 1989, one of us had to get elected mayor or we'd all be unemployed. So I drew the short straw and ran for mayor in 1989. One of my opponents running for the Green Party was Sandy Baird. I also had a Democratic opponent. I ran as, as an independent. I was elected in 1989. I went on to serve as mayor of the city of Burlington for, for seven terms, leaving office on my own accord in 2006. I did have one brief break, what I call the voter-inspired <laughs> sabbatical in 1993 and 1995. 
Uh, but it came back after that break and ran for office and was elected five times after losing that election in 1993. I say this just throughout my. We have some some folks coming. Come right in. Sorry, sorry. How's it going? Sorry for being late. That's okay. A lot of traffic. Throughout my political life, I've been a practitioner of what I call citizen diplomacy. So I'm just going to say a few words about what that has meant to me. And for me, citizen diplomacy is an idea that suggests that we not only have a right, but we have a responsibility to help shape U.S. foreign relations through person-to-person -person interactions with citizens from other countries. And so for me, citizen diplomacy, I'll use that word, sometimes it, 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 it comes under the broader auspices of public diplomacy, but the sister city programs are certainly, in Burlington's life, a major element, a major component of citizen diplomacy. And it involves people-to-people -people exchanges, it builds empathy, it builds mutual respect, and it results in a shared commitment to build a better world. I'm proud to be a citizen today in a city that has today, welcome Madam Mayor. Hello. Nice to have you nice with us. You. Yeah. But I'm proud to be a, a citizen of a city that today, and for my life in the city, going back 43 years, has had a municipal foreign policy. And I want to advocate that we continue to have a municipal foreign policy. And it should be, in my opinion, a foreign policy that's informed by direct relationships with communities around the world through the sister city programs. So I think that the sister city programs today, at a time when many of the national arena are arguing for isolationism, isolationism, at a time when we have strife in far too many places in the world, I think that city, uh, sister city programs and citizen diplomacy is more important than ever. And I appreciate the work that uh, Viti has done in terms of uh, call, calling this summit today, bringing together folks from the various sister city programs, and hopefully rejuvenate the movement. And I think, frankly, it's in trouble. I think many of the long-term sister city programs are, are dormant. Uh, but I think there's also a recognition of the value of sister city programs. And I think part of that recognition is that we now have a new sister city, which Ali and others will talk about in Senegal, as well as a new sister city in, in Ukraine. So when we, you, you can't have this discussion without also remembering Bernie's contributions over the years. And I think it's important to recall that Bernie's time as mayor of the city of Burlington, people often forget this. I'm not going to get too political, but I want to make this point. His time as mayor, with the exception of four months, overlapped the time of Ronald Reagan as president. Yeah. Imagine that. So I think one of the reasons that the city, uh, that the sister city programs arose was that we had to, to uh, make the decision. Are we content to allow the Reagan administration to determine foreign policy? Or would we, as one community, attempt to create our own foreign policy, which at times was at odds, was at odds with the national foreign policy, and would we attempt to forge our own diplomatic relations? Yes, at a grassroots level, but nevertheless important. So think about that. In the first sister city program was created in 1984, with Puerto Cabezas, Nicaragua, building. And this was created at a time 
when our federal government was supporting the Contras, and Burlington said, we disagree with that, but we don't just want to make policy statements, we want to get to know the people of Nicaragua on a person-to-person -person basis. So we forged that relationship in 1984. And it wasn't just talk. You know, we sent, in 1986, 500 tons of humanitarian aid to the indigenous people, the Mosquito Indian people of this remote town on the North Atlantic coast. 500, 500 tons. That was amazing. So, and then in 1988, our president was saying Soviet Union is the evil empire. We must destroy it. And we in Burlington said, maybe, but let's get to know those people. And so we've established a relationship with Yaroslav, beautiful city on the banks of the Volga River, and I know we have representatives here of, from, from the Yaroslav program. We established that relationship at a time when the Soviet Union was still in existence. In fact, I accompanied Bernie. There was a delegation, I believe 12 of us, to first visit Yaroslav in 1987. Imagine, I accompanied Bernie to Yaroslav as part of this delegation, but it was also Bernie's honeymoon. Mm. <laughs> that was 1988. <laughs> and then we found ourselves in the early 90s exploring another opportunity. And this opportunity was in the Middle East. And at a time when there was continued strife and turmoil in the Middle East, in the Palestinian territories specifically, Burlington said, we want to get to know on a personal basis the people of Palestine, and we're going to establish a Palestinian sister city relationship. And that was in 1991, those, uh, the, those, those discussions uh, Begin, and there was not everyone in this community felt that was a good idea. Uh, some said, well, "This will result in us being perceived as taking sides." And there was a discussion, a debate that went on for a year, and ultimately it was resolved by saying that we will simultaneously enter into a relationship with an Israeli community, the city of Iraq. It hasn't been easy for obvious reasons, some logistical, some that it's, it's, it's a war zone today, but uh, there have been some good results of the Burlington, Bethlehem, Iraq sister city uh, program. So I've been all these, these three sister cities that I've mentioned, I've been all of them. In fact, I think I've been to each of them at least five times, maybe six times each. So I know these communities. I've come to understand the, uh, the people. I've learned a lot. Uh, and there's some experiences that just uh, stand out in my mind. I remember, remember visiting Nicaragua in 1990 for the first time. And I'm on a military airplane traveling from Managua to Puerto Cabezas. And they had big benches along the, 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 the sides of this, of this uh, airplane. Half of the airplane was Sandinista soldiers that had been in the bush for years, returning home. The other half of the airplane were Contras, also returning home. They, came, they were coming from the same community, the same village. They knew each other. But obviously, the tension on that plane was intense. I'll never forget that day. And they all had guns. They all had guns. And they asked, are, are, are we, we, we going to make this? You know, again, I remember the visits early on to the Soviet Union. And we, we were there to experience the collapse of the Soviet Union 
and the introduction of uh, democracy to uh, Russia, as rough as it might have been, we experienced that. I remember being in Bethlehem when there, when I got caught in a crossfire of kids throwing stones at Israeli soldiers, it was occupied at the time, and the soldiers shooting back. Uh, rubber bullets, but then it deteriorated and it was not simply rubber bullets at, at, at that point. So these experiences have been profound and meaningful for me, but most important, more important than how I was affected, is how thousands of people from Burlington, but also our sister city counterparts have been affected over the past uh, 40 years uh, through these programs. And I think that uh, we are a stronger city as a result of this. I think that there is an awareness in Burlington about foreign affairs and international relations that does not exist in many communities because of the city programs. Uh, we took the lessons that we had learned internationally and after Hurricane Katrina said, let us have a domestic sister city, and we established a relationship with Moss Point, Mississippi, a predominantly uh, uh, African-American community uh, on, on, the, uh, on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi. And again, that was a very powerful experience. And we supported their revival of, of, of that community after the, uh, the hurricane. So these experiences have changed my life. They motivated me to enter into a, a profession of international development where after leaving the mayor's office in 2006, I went to work for a Burlington-based USA contractor, ARD at the time. It's now part of a larger company called Tetratech. And I was able to work around the world uh, designing and implementing uh, democracy and governance projects in developing countries around the world. And uh, that work yeah. took, took me to some interesting places, including uh, Afghanistan, but it also led me to Albania, uh, where I lived for four and a half years working on building the capacity of local government in, in Albania. So uh, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. I firmly believe that the lives of thousands have been enriched as a result of the city, uh, sister city program. But these are challenging times. It's challenging to keep these programs going forward. A number of them are in war zones. Some of them are in places, uh, Nicaragua comes to mind, that are suffering unheard of uh, uh, political oppression. And some of them are new opportunities, but also new challenges in Ukraine, in Senegal. So I think it's important to not only maintain these relationships, and I'm pleased that you're here, Mayor, because I think that that's a reflection of your interest in Burlington to continue to have uh, municipal foreign policy. But we, we can't only be content in maintaining these relationships, we must strengthen them. And I think that tonight's discussion will hopefully result in some ideas flowing to, so that we can better understand some of the history, but more importantly, look forward as to how we, 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 we can strengthen these uh, relationships. So uh, with that, I turn it back to Eric, and I thank you for the opportunity to uh, say a few words. I don't get the mic too often these days. <laughs> thank you very much, Peter. It's interesting with uh, technology. I uh, am producing the show with a tablet, and I have to also think about what to say. So it's a, you know, a message to those who think that uh, doing TV or recording a program is just turning on <laughs> a button. Back in the days when I was working for the Voice of America, there would be 10 people here. And one guy that would make sure that nobody 
uh, you know, uh, falls because, you know, his feet go, you know, <laughs> in the cables. He will call the cable man. Cable. Oh, le gaffeur. <laughs> Mesdames et messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have here our new mayor. I would like us to uh, give her a round of applause to uh, thank her for the honor. There's no sister city without the city of Burlington. So we hope that you know this gathering will be a bigger one, larger one next year. And then, you know, we'll have even people flying from uh, Yugoslavia. I, I hope they will be able to do that. Who knows? Um, now, uh, let me introduce uh, Sandy Bear, because uh, Sandy Bear has many hats. A lawyer who, from 6 a.m., starts calling me about, you know, a case that we have to win, otherwise this lady will lose her house. And at 8 a.m., have to tell me that we have to organize this summit. 9 a.m. has to <laughs> tell me that we have to go to uh, see the legislator with the kids from, you know, the community here so that they can know which country they're living in now. Sandy is also an historian. With her, I learned a lot about, you know, uh, uh, this country, but also even my own continent. With her, it's the travel around the world and Tonight, she's going to give a little historical perspective uh, about the um, uh, détente from below. Détente is, of course, this French word. Uh, what would be the uh, equivalent in English? Détente. Peace. Peace, or yeah, dis peace. Or disarmament. Voilà. Alors, Sandy, veux-tu venir yeah. ici ou rester là-bas? No. Tu viens ici. <laughs> Sandy Bear, please. I suppose I'd rather sit here. Okay, way, all right. Because I would like to have a discussion about why I'm so interested and always have been in detente from below, which was a real movement in the 80s. Um, and it was a movement that had quite a bit of strength in this country when we were discussing wars in Central America, wars in the Middle East, um, and continued wars pretty much everywhere. I think that even at that time, the United States was always involved in the colonialization of Africa. Um, however, that usually didn't even hit the newsstands. But wars were happening all over the world. At that time, as, as Eric mentioned, I was an attorney mainly. But I'd always been a teacher as well. And I had the great privilege and honor of becoming a faculty member at a school that tragically no longer exists here. And that was Burlington College. And I mean a medic a young woman who joined the United States from Bosnia was one of my students there. So she knows what a special kind of a place it was. And Grant Critchfield here also was a faculty member there. I was a faculty member there for probably 20, 25 years. And I had the great privilege of teaching history and politics and law and women's studies and lots of subjects. I only have a master's degree, which I never would have been allowed to teach anywhere else probably. But I had a great deal, too, of experience in politics. I had been a legislator. And so that place was so special, I was allowed to be a faculty member, as well as I was the director of the overseas study program at the University of Havana in Cuba, which Joanne Murad is here. And she was one of our resident directors there with her husband, Tim, who is a professor at UVM. Yeah. So when I was at, I was always a, a, I always had a huge passion for history. So I studied in college and was what I went to uh, the University of Wisconsin for. Um, and so at Burlington College, I had a real chance to study history, especially the history of the 20th century, and also to teach it. And that's, of course, the best way to know anything about any subject if you're, if you're forced to, or if you have the honor of teaching. And so I had a great deal of time and energy to study particularly the history of the 20th century. I taught other centuries, but it was really the 20th century, my century, which stirred my uh, thought because what the heck had gone wrong in the 20th century? Because it was a century, as we all know, of world war, continual world war, from almost the beginning of the 1900s until the tragic end. And of course, those wars are not still continuing. And I had a chance to also study the rise of nation states out of great empires. And to see that those nation states, for instance, France, England, 
uh, Germany, Italy. They were nation states that had been formed on the notion of who had been born where and what that community was. For instance, the German community became Germany versus an empire of many different people. But Germany, with all of its borders, became Germany. France did, England did, um, but many other places did not. For instance, there was the Russian Empire or the Ottoman Empire. But these nation states, out of the uh, origins in the capitalist system, were nations that were primarily located in Europe and among white nations in particular. And those nations were built, had borders, passports, frontiers, border crossings, checkpoints. And those nations, it seemed to me, had been based on continual war between elites, between elite classes, particular and alliances of those states, one nation state of alliances versus the other alliance. And what they were all attempting to do was rob people's resources and to have those resources in the hands of whatever elite was ruling those nations. Now, other empires, of course, were always at war with each other too. But the rise of the nation states built on borders, built on nationalities rather than a common nationality were really problems, and they were always at war with each other. And those wars only served an elite class, if you think about it. <laughs> they only served to build a military industrial complex and to build the profits of war and arms makers. And so I became real interested in kind of the way people under those nation states or within them, but were not part of the, of the elites, could relate to each other. And my question always became, people who know each other, who know their neighbors, really don't usually want to bomb each other. On occasion, of course, they do. If they have, uh, uh, they're mad at each other over something ridiculous, usually. But they don't really, once you get to know people, do you really want to bomb them? And I began to think about ways that people could have face-to-face -face contact with with the peoples of the world that maybe our government said should be our enemies. The government said they should be our enemies, but do people really think of each other as enemies automatically? Not if they know each other, is that? I mean, that's something I think we should discuss, but that became obvious to me that people who know each other face to face do not want to kill each other necessarily. Sometimes they do. But usually those disputes are more solvable than the kind of disputes that nation states ruled by elites have with each other. And so one of the first things I did was I admired the uh, Sanders administration. I was not a part of that administration. In fact, I opposed it. And sometimes, <laughs> as Peter said, I ran against him in 1989. But I always respected what they did in this community. And one of the best things I think that they always did was they brought international perspectives into our community that were incredibly valuable and mind-blowing to me in a way. What other cities were doing that? Not very many. That were asking people to get to know our neighbors, get to know people that, they, that our governments had defined as enemies. So the first one that I became involved, or not involved with, but that I knew about, but I actually visited it also, was the one in Nicaragua. At that time, I don't know how many of you people remember, but at that time, Nicaragua had been, uh, was being governed, I should say it that way, by a group of people called Sandinistas, who were rebels and who had taken that country kind of by surprise, and it had replaced a dictatorship. The Sandinistas were socialists, more or less, correct, as we all recall. And they were viewed by our national government as enemies, and it formed groups to overthrow the government of Nicaragua, and they were called the Contras. And I really admired Bernie Sanders at the time, was saying, hey, we shouldn't be part of this. We should let these people be alone and live out their own dreams of having the government that they wanted. And I remember that that was the first sister city I was aware of. That was the first one we did, right? We did. Yeah. And that was one that I was incredibly interested in. And I became interested in the whole idea 
that people below the national government, people at a grassroots level, have the possibility of making peace with each other. The elites probably never will. But people on the level of face-to-face, people-to-people contact can bring friendship, can bring business. See, I think doing business is a way of actually making friends. Doing business, making friends, sharing culture, all of those things alone can bring peace. The second place that I always got, I got involved in um, because of my passion, I don't know why, but I always have the passion to visit and to make friends with Cuba. So in 1991, I went to Cuba for the first time in 1981 and became transfixed by its very different kind of society. Problematic society in a lot of ways, but also people who loved us, who were so grateful to North Americans for visiting them, uh, because that was at a time again when the United States was busy trying to overthrow the government of Cuba. Cuba's, the government of Cuba is not my government, I don't, and I don't particularly criticize it, I don't particularly support it. However, I always supported the people of Cuba and of all of Latin America, and I became aware that I wanted to help the Cuban people or support them, put it that way, to support the Cuban people in living a more decent life. And what I saw our government doing to the Cubans were boycotts, embargoes, um, really uh, horrible blockades of Cuba so that they would become immiserated. So in 1991, I formed a group, and Joanne and, uh, is aware of this, called the Cuban American Friendship Society. And we, in that society, have doing, been doing trips for many years to Cuba, and we will probably do even teacher trips and lawyers trips. And in a way, just to show, look, at, we care about you, the people of Cuba, and we want to support them and be friends. And we're kind of ashamed at what our government has done to you. I mean, this is a nation essentially of poor people, black people, brown people. And I have no idea why the United States has sought to punish them so badly. Anyway, so that was another group. But I want to stress the idea of, again, once you go to Cuba, once you see people in Havana, you never want to hurt them, would you? You know, never. And it just, it, every time I hear the rhetoric against uh, Cuba, I think, where have they people been like Marco Rubio and that book? I mean, these are people that could be, that we should be friends with. They have a terrific culture, they have terrific art. We could learn so much from them, including a lot about baseball. Anyway, so. I had a baseball trip to Cuba a number of years ago. In 1991, and Paul Bakeman is here from another sister city that I was involved with, we Peter Peter Cabell. In 1991, we were, many of us, I had been in a study group about the Middle East and became firmly convinced that we needed to out, we needed to do something about the continued wars between Israel and their neighbors in Palestine. And as part of that Middle East study group, I, with Musa Ishaq and a number of Palestinian friends, we resolved to have a sister city in that region. We were the first, and that was really tough to do. The minute we suggested a sister city in Bethlehem, Palestine, kind of the city called the council went nuts, didn't it? Do you remember? Oh, yeah. And they did. It was hugely controversial went on for a very long time. In the end, the, what, what happened is that we said that that sister city was so, that that had resolved, it had fostered such a huge discussion that we decided to have a tripartite arrangement, Bethlehem, Palestine, Iran, and Israel, so, so that the, uh, both the Israelis and the Palestinians perhaps could even talk to each other through that tripartite arrangement. And that sister city was founded in 1991. Um, and that continues to this day and really has been a vigorous sister city program for a very long time. But anyway, I still believe that, that once you get to know your neighbors, once, once you begin to treat other people in other countries as human beings uh, rather than as enemies, and that can only happen, it seems to me, to face-to-face 
contact with people. I still believe in this kind of peace building from below. Out of the, even sometimes out of the sight of those people in power, people to people contact, make friends anytime you can. It's a good idea. The, the, the uh, Cuba was the most difficult to do because of the, no, it wasn't, I shouldn't say that, it wasn't the most difficult. But it was difficult to do given a real hostility of the U.S. government. That had to be really done very carefully and legally. But also the one in Bethlehem was very uh, tricky also and difficult. But I can't stress enough, and I'm so happy that the mayor is here tonight because I know her family, I know her a little, I wish I knew her better, but I know their interest also in international affairs, in international, how I would put it, solidarity with the peoples of the world. And I'm so happy to see us here today. And I'm, I, I tried to do the, sun, the summit with this in mind, that it's time to reinvigorate our sister cities. It's time to do that. The last 12 years, there hasn't been much attention paid to the sister cities. I'm so happy to see Ali here at the end because he is the founder of our um, most recent sister city, our first one in Africa, correct? In uh, Senegal. And also, I'm so happy to see you all here and again, it's time to get busy to reinvigorate the wonderful program of the sister cities throughout the world. Thank you. Okay. Now, tell me uh, if you don't mind, would like to hear a little bit from the mayor who is yes. visiting us. A little word. Maybe she can tell us, you know, how she plans to bring home. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, okay. After the video, we'll have uh, our um, uh, discussion. So, uh, Madame Le Maire, yes. I, I have to. Go. Oh, no. Yes, I have to. Yes, the job for me to jump in. Say something. And someone's air pockets. So, I actually appreciate being able to, to jump in because I'm doing double duty with downstairs at the uh, MPA, which I'm going to head to in a few minutes. And I ran into Ali and I was like, I couldn't be in two places at once, but I had about half an hour and I wanted to come up. And one of the things that is clear, uh, and I really appreciate Sandy, your final comments, because as you do a transition from any administration, there's only so much you can piece together about why certain things seem to have been put on the back shelf, fallen off the shelf, versus other things that are put in the front of the shelf, if you will. And so it's, it, I appreciate that perspective because it has been a little bit of a um, mystery about the health and well-being of our sister cities and knowing that we've just established a new one and the importance of that, of course. And even just being here for these first 30 minutes and understanding the intentional, and I emphasize the intentionality there are in the 80s in particular, around the counterweight and how important that is on a grassroots and local level to be a counterweight to whatever is happening on the national level. And to former mayor, Gil Bell around the um, importance, as we all know, on the eve of what could possibly happen again in November and how critically important it is um, to be proactive in that space and really take um, really take charge in our own community around making sure that whatever happens on the federal level, let's also all cross our fingers and organize, of course, to make sure that doesn't happen, but that we don't we don't get pulled into that loop, that there is that there is true um, that solidarity element that Sandy was mentioning before as well. And that is such a critical part to make sure Burlington's on the map and leading with our values and leading with um, that commitment to peace to, to um, uh, making sure we're modeling that for our young people in this community. Because there is such an intersectionality as well around how that, uh, well, both what our community looks like today and is today, um, who lives here today, and the international and interconnectedness that we have with so many, many, many parts in the, of the world, not even in, including, but beyond our sister cities, of course. Um, I think about our new Afghani folks, uh, folks are all from the Sudan, other parts, of course, in um, uh, Bosnia, etc., throughout the whole world that have really made Burlington their home. And so looking forward, I really look forward to making sure that we can uh, continue to bring the sister cities back to the front of the shelf, if you will, um, and make sure that, frankly, that people remember the history. Uh, there was 12 years in the last administration where even, I will admit myself, lost a little bit of the thread about the purpose and significance. And most importantly, honoring our newest city um, in Senegal and that, that important connection and make sure that is clear, um, not only to our young people, but for everyone who lives here in Burlington. 
and voted for a mayor about this year who was here as well. So it's nice to be surrounded by former mayors. It is wild job. And with that, I'm going to slip downstairs, but I look forward to following up further conversations to get further into how do we, what does support look like? And even, you know, I was just talking to my wife the other day, how can we even think about modern day sharing skills? So beyond keeper and people and culture um, and business, it's also infrastructure and know-how and climate resiliency and and just, just you know, all the justice-oriented parts that Burlington has known so well about. Like, I think there's such great opportunity there to really do skill share and just um, community building on the most fundamental level. So more Thank to you. Come. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Le Maire, Madame Le Maire. Like you said like that. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I also uh, will uh, remember that Sandy said that business mm. is also a way to create bridges and, and, and to bring people together. Uh, we have a big asset, which is uh, the communities that are becoming new Americans. Among them, we can, uh, as Peter said also, because he traveled the world through the you know, USA program, Mr. Cartel, and so on. We can make them ambassadors of our, even Vermont only. You know, they can help sell our cheese. They can sell, sell our technologies. You know, I have friends that come from France just to get the uh, um, goat cheese with blueberry. <laughs> I mean, they line up to do that with cheese. No, you know, people don't just come here to color or to colorize our community or to diversify our community. They can be instruments of peace, instruments of, you know, uh, 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 diplomacy. A lot of them, even me, I tried once to have a business in Africa. But I went there as an Ivorian rather than going as an American company. I learned my lesson. Now we can help those people get us in their country. We don't need those big guns because now, because China is in the region, West Africa, you know, predominantly, and Russia is rising there. The U.S. thinks that the response is militarism, showing that we have bigger guns, but it drifts us away from people. My father wouldn't wear any other shoes but floor shine shoes. <laughs> I grew up with a portrait of JFK in my uh, 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 you know, living room. So much so, people loved JFK, loved America that JFK was, you know, showing to the world. So much so that even. Uh, pink eyes uh, epidemic during the mission to Apollo was called now Apollo. If you have pink eyes in Ivory Coast, they say you have Apollo, like the mission that we are doing. So now, uh, all these uh, sister cities are trying to uh, to get back to uh, to uh, you know to business. Peter now will uh, uh, conduct that discussion among us, you know, see how, you know, we can learn from what we did uh, since the, uh, the inception of this movement and then what is next, how we can do a better, especially in Africa. Thank you, Ali, uh, Jack, for bringing TS. Thank you so much. It's just six hours from here by uh, Jack, so uh, hopefully uh, we'll be, yeah, Sandy. <laughs> Just, oh, it started already, so let's go. No, I just wanted to have Ali say a few words about yeah. our uh, our newest sister city, if you would. You want to do that? Sure. Uh, oh, here? What? Yeah. 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 For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ali. I used to be a city council for... <laughs> Down a little bit, so wow, okay. yeah. Wow. Okay. yeah, city council for seven years, and I also have been a candidate for men. I don't want to be speaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y
Yeah. Just yeah. But I just grow up and, and like me. And I remember it was Green Up Day, that's when I met them met, met them at City Hall Park near the waterfront we were cleaning up. I was an American member, just three seconds. Completely new. My English was not even good. It's still not good, but it's better now. <laughs> now, um, and I think we need to think globally and try to act at a local level. Mm-hmm. Right? And I think Burlington has become uh, the state of Vermont, a settlement state since the 80s, right? Where we have a lot of people from Laos all over the world settling in, the, in this great state. And just that is such an opportunity that I don't believe that Burlingtonian or Vermonters have tapped into it. So, like, people who are living here just need help and support services. No, they have so much to offer, so much perception about life, so much culture, like, so much way of doing things that I believe that students and young people, I mean, people from all generations can learn. And how do we facilitate that at this at that level as well? Because it doesn't exist, right? And I think in the political realm, it would be also very important for people to understand that we are we should not be enemies. It doesn't matter where we come from or where we live. We should not be enemies. I think our enemy should be the aliens, but not us you, right? All of that I, that I heard in terms of war, in terms of guns, is completely wrong. I think we have one big issue, which is climate change, and it doesn't matter what we do best here. But if we do well here, and somewhere else in Africa or you know in Europe or Asia is not doing well, we are not making any progress because the threat is not only for one specific community, but the threat is for every single one of us. Our humanity is so important. Reason why these citizenship programs are so, so important. They are important in so many different levels. Because in order for you to live a life filled with this joy and happiness, most of you have traveled, most of you have went and seen how all the way of life of doing things. And how people are sometimes living with almost nothing, but they still happy. They still have joy. They still have a sense of of sharing, right? But when I moved here, that became very apparent and very clear to me that the way of living here is almost this mine, my home, my car, right? My, my, my. And if you pay attention as an educator, you teach that to kids at a very young age and you don't even pay attention. Compared to my experience as an African, I thought that this there is an opportunity to cross the cultures and to cross people to understand what other way what what is beautiful from this country or from these people that I can try to learn and also grow. What can they learn from me in order for them also to grow, right? I'm glad to hear all the historical perspective here. But it will be also very important to know that the way in which we create the Sister C program, Barbara Shantra here from the library has played an integral role in terms of understanding of how to do things. Sandy Bear, Sandy, Mayor Peter Clavel, the historical perspective. They gave me the hope and the courage to say, okay, are you be doing something, but this time it's not between Israel and Palestine. But this time it is to bring people together. This time it's to bring, uh, to bring something new. Wellington has never had a sister city program with any African community. It doesn't exist. And for the first time, we now have it. We based it on the military partnership, I'm sorry, that the Vermont National Guard has with the state of Senegal. And the military partnership existed since 2008. It's now 15 years strong partnership. Many Senegalese military or firefighters are coming here to be trained, right? To be given some equipments. And the soldiers from the Vermont National Guard 
I believe you said about you know, helping people at the hospital, helping doctors, helping them uh, with uh, equipment, helping them with so many different things, right? And I think that's so beautiful. Military is coming together, but this time it's not about wars, but this time it's about partnership. They even call it military partnership. The Panama National Guard, I think we also need to uh, recognize the beautiful work that Chief General Knight is also doing in terms of one legislation at the state level called S30. You can look it up. Called S30. That resolution, that that uh, legislation is trying for Vermont to have a state partnership with four different countries around the world, and we are all testifying in order for those countries to include um, Seneca to include um, all the countries in, in, in Macedonia, for example, right? to include all the many, many, many different And I think that is an opportunity of a lifetime. What African people can do is not to give a lot of dollars, but it is to give a lot of culture. It is to give a lot of ways of understanding um, of, of, of raising children and also being an active member of combating climate change from the perspective of what Burlington is doing. And Burlington, you can say, is leading the nation, is leading parts, many parts of the world in terms of climate change mitigation. Opportunities are so uh, well thought out. And also the sister city, the exchanges that the Vermont Council on World Affair, I think you were part, part of it too, are ways in which we need to strengthen and do more. Iraqi's children are right here, right now, in the state of Vermont, looking for places in which they can stay, right? Um, and I think from the city's perspective, if I stayed as a city councilor, it would be one thing. The Parks, Arts, and Culture Committee need to be changed a little bit and add the sister city component, mm -hmm. where all sister cities will come and provide the dates and talk about their programming and talk about opportunities that we have. It's not only about uh, them coming here, but it's also about Americans from time to time to be visiting their sister cities, states, right, cities around them in order to learn and grow. What is also an opportunity with our students, the Burlington School District, Burlington High School, or even South Burlington and Milton, all the high schools around the state in order for them to go and visit and have these exchanges, I think it would be beautiful. The, system, the city of Burlington also is providing, as part of their budget, maybe $2,000 for sister city programming, it doesn't necessarily do a lot, but we have many people who are ready to help the city to strengthen this program, such as the Parliament of families, such as many other, many other in order for these exchanges to be real, to be strengthened, to be beautiful, and to bring people together for peace, right? For peace. Um, I am going to end by mm -hmm. just saying what Eric just said. At a global level, Africa right now is being watch very closely. There is this uh, race between America, between uh, Russia, and between China. If you go to Senegal right now, everything being built right now, right there, is by the Chinese people. They're building stadiums, they're building bridges, they're building um, schools, they're building roads, they're building a lot of stuff in order to make a better cooperation with the African people. What people don't know is America is losing a battle right there in West Africa. It's today that I heard that, that what, are, what are they interested about is just the military. They just built a new base in yeah. Ivory Coast. It's just today. And I think, what if it was a, a, a bridge? What if it was climate change mitigation? What is what it was more education opportunities for young people, for the generations to come, the tech, the STEM, right? I think the focus is there, and each and every single one of us in here, we need to try to change the perspective so that we shift the way we're thinking about um, connections to not be arms, but to just be about love 
and peace and across the world. Just letting you have that. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, so I, I've been asked to moderate and I'm going to uh, take a few liberties. One is I'm going to ask everyone here to introduce yourself, but also if you have an affiliation with a particular sister city program, I'd like you to identify that affiliation. Uh, Steve. Good time. I was the city engineer public work director. So, 30 years, and I did serve as, I guess we call it, an ambassador in 2012 on the Yaroslav program. My perspective isn't as someone who founded anything, but I was sort of a cog in the wheel at the time. And I'm glad to share some of that perspective, but I'd also want to give my seat to someone else who has even more knowledge about the program. We have the leadership of the program here that can fill in with the current, but uh, we'll move to that after we have introductions. So. I'm also able to hear what I like, though. I'm Ken Fisk. I'm helping uh, Sandy Baird and Eric mostly with the, helping or Eric with the production somewhat. And helping Sandy with uh, a little bit of research. Okay. Bob? Uh, Bob Kiss, if we were there uh, 2006 to 2012. Um, I've definitely uh, been involved with the Sister City Project regarding Eurosol. I mean, the gender and the sense that I'm uh, Grant Critchfield. I'm in charge of the Young Critch Department. We've totally involved in our study abroad program in Nice for many years and support this whole idea of international exchange really strongly. Great. Great. I'm Tim Murad. Retired professor of New Japan, Latin American literature in Spanish. And I want to thank Sandy Baird for having found a second career for my life after she retired from the, the, the um, president director of the Pro Lincoln College Havana semester program. And I'll let her introduce herself. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, so Joanne Mirad, and uh, yes, as my husband said, I was very much um, gratified to say that Sandy chose me to go to Havana with a group of students, and I continued to do it for six years. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, in doing that, it's part of it is being able to meet people on a personal level, getting to know what's really going on in the country with the people, not with the government. Um, and it's been an incredible experience. And I think, of course, with all of the sisters programs, even though this is not really that, um, what we do is, is wonderful, amazing, and so, Helpful, it's nutritious mm -hmm. for people to do this. Thank you, Sandy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm Minnie Sarmino Medic, and originally I'm from Bosnia. I was Sandy's student at Burlington College, and uh, um, I support her work 100%. And I just want to see if I could be out of any help. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Brian Perkins. Uh, I teach folkloric music. And in 1985, I, I donated a guitar for the Puerto Cabezas program, and I, I want to know what happened to it. Was, <laughs> does it need tuning or strings? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Oliver Carling. Um, I am here representing the Burlington Yaris Level Sisters Program. I'm currently serving as president. I've been, on, I've been involved with the program since 2017. Um, I, I work for the Middlebury Library Schools, but I uh, grew up in Burlington and uh, went to UVM. Uh, that's where I started studying Russian about the, about the time that the Sister City program was launched. So 89, I took my first Russian course. And so um, uh, we are one of those programs that is in a kind of dormant status, but where our board, uh, I'm here with, I have two fellow board members, and we're 
um, we continue to meet and, and, and talk about plans for the future and try to stay in touch with uh, Russian friends um, there in Yaroslavl. I'm going to invite you up in a minute to. Oh dear. To <laughs> <laughs> say a few more words. Uh, I'm sure. representative of the program, but happy to. That's fine. Barbara? Uh, Barbara. Uh, I'm Barbara Shatera. I'm on the board of the Yaroslavl Sister City. I traveled there twice and hosted um, a couple uh, tours here of librarians and some other uh, people. And I've been involved with this, that sister city since around 2007. Um, and I have a tangential um, involvement with the Alms Lord Sister City. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Yeah, I'm Paul Bakeman. I'm with the uh, Burlington Beth Amelrod Sister City Program. I'm serving as a secretary on the, on the board now. Uh, I'm not a good secretary, but uh, I'm serving there anyway. <laughs> uh, and uh, our, our sister city has been very active, I would say, over the years. And uh, uh, until the onset of COVID, we had exchanges back and forth, mostly from uh, uh, Palestine to, to uh, Burlington. Uh, we've had art exhibits and various activities as well that we sponsored. Uh, and we also sponsored... Steve, Steve, so, uh, I'm going to put you up here as well. And I think we'll, 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 okay, we'll, you, you we'll, don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be even better recorded if you're, if yeah, you're here. Okay. Come on. So, so Paul, <laughs> Paul, 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 I'm going to ask you yeah, yeah, each so, to take a seat. Okay, come on, sit. Okay. You got yourself into it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We don't need a lengthy presentation, but I think yeah. just a few more words on the current status of activities. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Of, of the programs that you represent. Uh, and also, if you'd like to highlight some of the lessons learned, as well as the challenges that you face. Just take about three minutes and give us a, a brief update uh, on your program. Well, like I said, we prior prior to the COVID, we were able to do that. Uh, since the COVID, uh, our activities have been restricted first because you couldn't exchange people, you couldn't travel, and then since the hostilities broke out in the area, people aren't allowed to travel. So uh, it's it's been it's been more. Uh, just contact and we support some programs. At uh, a recent meeting, we uh, voted to uh, fund a student in a school because the schools in uh, Bethlehem have lost their income. Bethlehem's income is predominantly uh, tourism. 80% uh, of it is tourism, and there is no tourism in Bethlehem. So there facing some very difficult problems uh, in the West Bank. But could I make an announcement of using that? Yes. Because um, we learned on Sunday that a minister, Peter Cook, who was formerly at the Congregational Cong uh, College Street Congregational Church, is leading a group to Bethlehem in September, uh, which is going to be incredibly educational about the state of of um, those two countries, but primarily it's going to be touring Palestine. But that's available and it's open to the public. And Musa Isak, who is the president still of the Burlington Bethlehem Marat Sister City program, says to me that it will be safe because it must be that the government of Israel supports this trip. So it's open to the public. If anybody's interested, uh, please let one of us know. And last summer we had a visitor from Israel come and give us a presentation as well. Yeah. And his daughters went to, went to a uh, uh, circus, circus, the circus, uh, circus? circus? Yeah. Circus. Yes. Yeah. He, he was able to bring his family in. Yeah. So again, my name is Oliver, um, and the You've heard a little bit about the history of, of the sister-city relationship with Um I was uh, a 
Again, I became involved in 2017. I was able to go travel with the delegation in 2018 to celebrate 30 years of cooperation and partnership. Um, exchange, all kinds of exchanges from jazz musicians to hockey teams to mm. librarians, nurses, um, many different kinds of exchanges, um, small business owners. Um, and our last in-person uh, exchange was to bring a, a, a team of amateur hockey players uh, to, to Burlington in 2020, in February, uh, to participate in the pond hockey tournament. Um, and then um, shortly after that, of course, the pandemic started. And, um, we tried to do some things uh, during the pandemic online. So um, uh, we organized a meeting um, of high school students in Yaroslavl, uh, several Yaroslavl is a much larger city as the population. The population of Yaroslavl is similar to the population of Vermont as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are many high schools in Yaroslavl, and so uh, we had this sort of um, online event for high school students on both sides to meet each other and, and have a discussion of, mainly about how the pandemic was affecting their lives and. Uh, their plans for the future, how they were uh, spending time. Uh, uh, and um, another thing we did online was a, this online, it was a festival that had been in person um, mm -hmm. in Yaroslav called the Bridge Over the Ocean Festival. Um, we did that online um, in, I think it was in December of 2021, maybe. And I think it was reasonably successful. It involved people from both sides, um, musicians from both sides, um, a, a conference that took place uh, with uh, participants on both sides. So uh, then came the invasion of Ukraine. Um, and we put out a statement with the mayor's office uh, condemning the invasion. Um, at that time, uh, sister city official ties between the city governments of Yaroslavl and Burlington were cut off. Um, that did not mean that we had to stop talking with our friends in, in Yaroslavl. Um, you know, we're uh, a nonprofit organization like some of the other sister city uh, programs. Um, and we had a sister city, we had a kind of sister organization, another nonprofit in Yaroslavl. Uh, but I think it's been very difficult for them to operate. Um, it's it's uh, it's dangerous for people to have ties, uh, you know, uh, with the United, United States right now. And we have tried to be respectful of that. Um, and it's one reason why it's been it's been hard to even organize online events since we don't want to put people in a situation. Uh, people in our uh, we don't want to put them in any kind of danger. So. So um, we continue to meet and, and talk about ideas, uh, things we can do in the meantime while we wait for a time when we can sort of uh, start arranging, start organizing exchanges again. Um, we're excited about the new sister city programs. We're excited about the program in Senegal. Where, what is the name of the city in Senegal? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we're really excited also about the, the sister city relationship uh, with Ukraine. Um, we understand that a delegation uh, traveled there on January 24th. I'm not sure if they're back yet, um, but we have invited uh, Colin, uh, who's part of that, uh, and he's expressed interest in this as well. We, we've invited him to meet with us and, and just talk about how the, um, uh, how the trip went. Um, he's he's you said uh, what did I say? Uh, another, yes, June 24th, yeah. sorry. Mm -hmm. Correct. January 24th, that would have been right. So I'm not sure if they're back yet. But <laughs> June 24th, so. Um, um, he's so first of all, just a little bit of background about our relationship with Colin and uh, uh, another member of the uh, delegation, Adam. Um, they were both part of that 2018 trip to Yaroslav, so we have that sort of background and that connection with each other. Um, and Colin said he's interested in learning how we've organized uh, you know, exchanges in the past and whether there's you know, some sharing that can happen there. And of course, um, you know, I have broader interests in the, uh, the post-Soviet countries and, and I'm really interested in Ukraine, so I really would love to hear about it. So, yeah. lessons learned. Um, I guess one lesson is um, um, it's a challenge to maintain interest in these programs. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, <laughs> 
uh, we found, the, for example, taking the example of the, the high school student exchange, um, there was tremendous interest on the Yaroslav side, and there were all these English teachers who were, you know, excited to um, sign up their students to talk with students on this side. And on this side, it was it was quite a challenge to find any students who would be willing to, you know, just to just to sign in on on Saturday. Um, and so, so luckily, some, you know, we did have some who showed up, and we had a teacher from Burlington High School um, who, you know, made sure his students signed, uh, showed up. So that was great. But, um, but we have found there's, there is a lot of interest in the arts level, and, uh, uh, but always, you know, as we all know, I think, to, to, to remind our fellow uh, Burlington area residents, you know, the, these programs will exist, and to keep that interest going is, is something we all have to work on. Mm -hmm. so. So. I'll open it up for discussion, but just to round it out and for a matter of record, uh, the city council at the time they established the former relationship with Pease and Senegal also established this relationship with, you have the pronunciation? I, I think it's Kuli Nak, something like that. It's a, it's a city adjacent to Odessa. And again, in, instrumental in creating that relationship were Colin Hilliard mm -hmm. and Adam Roof. Adam was a former uh, city councilor in Burlington. Uh, Adam, at least at this moment, is living in Massachusetts. Yeah. He took on a job with the Massachusetts Democratic Party, so he has been not as present in Burlington, but he continues to be active in this program. Uh, and, and there was a delegation of at least I believe four people that were in Ukraine just uh, a week ago. And there was a story, if you're interested, on uh, WCAX uh, TV that you can go into the archives and it's a good description of uh, some of the plans for, 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 for that program. Mm -hmm. When was this? Uh, just uh, last week. Last week? Yeah. I, I should also acknowledge, Al Fleur was mentioned, but yes, this, this is one of our newer mm -hmm. programs. Uh, Al Fleur is the, is the hometown of uh, Samuel D. Champlain, or at least the place that he departed on many of his adventures, including the one that resulted in the discovery of Lake Champlain. But uh, I had a chance to visit Al Fleur uh, two years ago, and it's a fabulous yeah. city, it's a beautiful city. Uh, in Normandy, and the uh, uh, the hospitality of the of the folks was, was was remarkable, and it's probably at this moment the most active uh, sister city program. I don't know. Is there anybody here who's involved in in that program that could? Uh, I did. I did contact this? Elise Barano, who was uh, used to be the director right. of, that, of that program, but and she responded that it was still active. But she didn't ever say if she was going to come tonight. Okay. But it's a very important sister city because it's with France, who remember helped the United States win its independence from England. Right. A sister republic. And then, then lastly, uh, Puerto Cabezas, Nicaragua. I yeah. mentioned it, and others have as well. It's it's also called the Billy. That's the uh, the, the locals call it the Billy. That's the indigenous name for it. And Dan Higgins, who yeah. was hoping would be here this evening, continues to be the president of the uh, uh, Sister City program. They have a board that meets at least on an annual basis. I'm on that board, so I know a little bit about what's going on with that program. But I would say right now it's largely dormant, in part because the government of Nicaragua has placed very serious restrictions on communications uh, that might have uh, a, 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 a political content, and uh, so that they're really putting the lid on anything that might be viewed as being uh, not supportive of the government, and they have actually adopted a law recently that, that uh, makes it illegal for foreign-related uh, nonprofits uh, uh, to 
function in the country. So this is an interesting situation that yeah. at a time of political oppression, I think our friends in Nicaragua could use support yes. in communication, but it's very difficult in the same way as U.S. model for people to uh, to travel, to openly communicate. And uh, uh, but I, I know that there's that, that, that Dan is willing. This program exists today because of Dan Higgins, a retired professor from the University of Vermont. But he is looking to pass the baton on, and there's no one yet who's willing to has receive that baton. So this is, I think, one of the problems that many of the sister city programs are suffering with. Many of the active participants have been involved for 30 or 40 years and uh, there doesn't seem to be a cadre of new younger people that are willing to uh, to, to to be engaged so that's one of the challenges that's being faced so I, at this point i'd like to open this up for a, a, a discussion i'd like to hear some ideas as to what might be done uh to rejuvenate the interest I, on one hand, we talked about the importance of sister city programs and citizen diplomacy. On the other hand, we talked about how many of the programs are not particularly active at this moment, and uh, some could be called uh, dormant. Uh, the fact that there are two new programs that are being launched I, in Ukraine and Senegal, I think that that's a suggestion that there is an interest uh, and there's a recognition of the importance of, of this form of diplomacy, but uh, what can be done to re-energize, to rejuvenate the, uh, the sister city programs broadly? Sandy. Yeah, I want to commend the Yaroslavl program in particular for keeping up because I was fairly shocked that uh, that during because of this war that was the suggestion that we cut off Russia after all it's because of war that we have to make peace and so I really commend the people and you in particular the leaders of the Aeros Global Program for not allowing uh, Russia to be cut off they are after all still people they're people who helped us a great deal in World War II and so I'm very happy that that relationship did not die but one thing is what I'm going to suggest is to keep on going. I don't know exactly how to do that, but I know that it's probably one of the most important movements throughout our country. I think also COVID had a lot to do with cutting off all personal relationships. Right. And so I think, especially with our new mayor, who has a great deal of history and international solidarity, that there's a real chance to reinvigorate that, those peace programs. But at the moment, yeah. the city's position has been to suspend formal relationships with Yaroslav, right? Mm -hmm. well, yes. I, but, but the nonprofit organization, the 501c3, the Yaroslav System City Program, continues to be active. Correct. Yeah. So we just have to have a good talk with the mayor about reestablishing yeah. re that, yes. I think. Other folks have thoughts as to uh, what, what might be done to infuse some new energy uh, into the sister city programs? You know, one of the very active, uh, going back to Port of just for a moment, uh, I, I should point out uh, four years ago now, they had back to back hurricanes. Yeah. You know, it's, it's massive destruction. Uh, in the area, but the city program launched a fundraising campaign, and we raised, I think, around fifteen thousand dollars, which then was invested in uh, community rebuilding in, uh, in Portia Basis. Uh, some of it going directly to nonprofit uh, organizations that were rebuilding facilities and homes as well. I would Sure. You mentioned that the WCAX had a program about. Well, it, it, it was it was featured 
uh, on their nose. So if you go to the WCAX website, you'll find it there. Okay. Or if you Google Burlington, Ukraine, Ukraine, sister city, it'll pop up. It was a good story. Uh, oh. And uh, you know, well, I, I, I certainly you. wouldn't know how to do it, but how do we publicize the sister cities? Yeah. I think that's important. <clears throat> we don't do it very well, that's for sure. Well, we have had for the past 12 years, yeah. especially during COVID. But there's a real chance, I think, to reinvigorate them. What do you think, Ali? I mean, a couple of things come to mind. And I think, first and foremost, the parks, arts, and culture community need to change need to, mm -hmm. to involve now the sister city component. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's the closest thing. And I remember I created the racial equity and inclusion committee for the city of Toronto. And I think we can just do it through a resolution mm -hmm. that I can draft, <coughs> maybe send it to you for review and then identify a city council a city councilor who can bring it to the city council to say now the Parks, Arts and Culture Committee is officially now the Parks, Arts and Culture Committee and Sister City Committee, that of it. We add that element into it as a standing committee of the city council. Mm -hmm. That's one, one thing, and I can draft it, and yeah. then we, we find someone. And I think, too, that same resolution can also involve any sister city Committee, any sister cities, right? That state, for example, Senegal, right. for example, Ukraine, so, for example, all of it, their flags, the flags of those countries, need to be at our airport. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Somewhere yeah. Yeah. in our airports, where it's yeah, like listed, mm -hmm. okay, these are the sister cities of the city of Burlington, and we have a place, we yeah. in any place where it's there. Anyone who know would know that these, you know, uh, okay. sister city countries. I think that's one thing also that we can do. And I think the third element, this is this is it. Mm -hmm. Each representative of a sister city, at least on a bi-monthly basis, we need to come together again yeah. to talk yep. about challenges, opportunities, and things like that. I think it would be better. Mm -hmm. Those are three things concrete that we can do. I also think like in the um, city hall we display art representing uh, another country's art, mm -hmm. especially sister city. It would be really great for people who are coming in to educate themselves as well to know that there is a sister city and this is the art from their mm -hmm. country. Yeah. In city hall. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to see, I really like what you're saying, I, that, that's what I kind of wished we had been for a long time, because the sister cities, as long as I've been involved, have been kind of siloed, you know, they're all doing their own thing, um, and I think it's really important to have us as a group, we are a group, it'd be great to have like a board, you know, mm -hmm. a, you know representatives, oh, yes. yeah, to, to keep, because it's, and especially like you were talking about climate change earlier, you know, it, the, I, I, that's a global thing. Mm -hmm. You know, there are things that are going to map over to all of these different um, relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and I think having sort of a more, co you know, coordinated approach would be better. Yes. Yes. What about a festival of the sister cities mm -hmm. where you would have food and mm -hmm. in the spring maybe? No music, maybe. Yeah. Is there a web page? Huh? There, there is a web page on the page. city's website. Each some of the individual um, have uh, websites of their own. I did years ago. I did create one for everyone. It was back back in the day of like you know early Google yeah. you know websites. You know, so it doesn't really exist anymore. But um, but yeah, there there was an attempt to do that. But there really needs to be like a webmaster so you can yeah oversee it. Yeah, there is. I mean, one simple thing that could be done is there is 
information on the city's website, mm -hmm. but it's very old. It was information that uh, has been there since I was mayor. Uh, one of the serious problems that we face in terms of the management of these programs is, it, is the coordination. Yeah. Like the, the, the power and the strength of the sister city programs is with volunteers, you know, citizens who are interested in engaging in citizen diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And nothing will happen without that interest mm -hmm. of, of individual citizens. Mm -hmm. But it also requires coordination to get things done. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the city's support, financial support, people should know this, these things are not absorbing a lot of taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. Each sister city program, and I assume this will be the case of the two new ones as well, mm -hmm. gets, gets uh, $2,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And that's been the level of funding that they've received for the past 35 years. So we're not talking a lot of city investment here. But maybe there's a way that we could better coordinate mm -hmm. the programs and rather than each just the city program, because now there's a total of three, uh, four, five, six, right? Mm -hmm. Six active city, sister city programs. Could we somehow come up with a mechanism of uh, uh, providing administrative support, mm -hmm. logistical support to all of them? Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> Our, our sister city uh, does not have a tax exempt status. Mm -hmm. uh, and are all the sister cities separate? Do they have separate tax IDs and things like that? Or is it all under the city uh, as a one unit kind of thing? No. How are they well, set it's up? not one unit. That's it's it's definitely not one, okay. unit, one unit in uh, Yaroslavl and in, in Puerto Cabezas. Uh, <coughs> Structured as separate 501c3s. That's true for yes. Flora as well. Okay, for on Flora as well, right. But I don't think that's true of going to Bethlehem. No, we're not. No, no, it is probably it is, not true of it. Yeah, we're in the process of setting it up. You're in the process. So so how, how are you setting it up? Through the um, state, state. Okay, state? that is, okay. Yeah. Through your state? Oh. No. The state of Vermont. The secretary. The secretary. The secretary. Okay. Yes. This sounds a little. It were incorporated as a nonprofit, but I don't think we have a federal tax ID. I see. I'm, I'm not sure of whether we have one or not. Uh, but uh, you know, we just want to get through that process because that I think donations would be a good way to get extra exactly. funding for all the systems. Right. But that would require an overarching. And I was going to ask you: Is there some overarching? structure yeah. all of them. There, no. There's not. There's not. There's not. There's not. Set up. Right. And each program is a subset. Right. A subsidiary of the overarching 503B or whatever it is. Right. That uh, would bring coherence to right. all of them. You know what I mean? There's, a, there's like 500 cities in the United States that have international right. sister cities. And I've always been a believer in uh, management by plagiarism. Let's let's yeah. figure out what's working in other places and see if there's something that we might borrow in terms of how, how, how to better manage the, the, these these programs. And there is a uh, an organization called Sister yeah. Cities International, yeah. mm -hmm. and. The city used to be a member of that, and Bob, I don't know if is it? if they were. They're supposed, they're supposed, you're supposed to be a member of it now, but I don't know if they are. Yeah. But well, we've been. I've been to one meeting of it. Yeah. Well, Moose and Chris went yeah, one time too. We should. But we should, I don't know if the city is paying the dues that are required. That's, that's the point. And Sister City International. Sister right. City International, and you got to take a look at that if you're interested in uh, what other communities are doing, and also. You know, wearing my former hat as the board member and the past uh, the president, chair of the board of Vermont Council on World Affairs, in some areas, the Council on World Affairs plays a role in coordinating, organizing mm -hmm. sister city activities. Mm -hmm. And that's something which we've had some just very preliminary discussions about. 
and that might be worth uh, considering as, as, as well. But I think that more would get done yeah. if there was better coordination. I know way many years ago, the Fort the Basis uh, program had a part-time uh, mm -hmm. coordinator uh, on, on, on a payroll, and yeah. that was a time of great activity. For all of the sister cities? No, just just forty five basis. Yeah. So any other any other thoughts? I think, I think probably wonderful. Uh, the best thing would be to have a coordinating committee, right? At least of all of us that would consist of people right here. How often? So that we could keep up to date with with you. I think that first of all, we I think we should approach the mayor mm -hmm. to reinvigorate. All of the sister city programs, and she clearly she's interested right. um, in terms of internationally in solidarity. Right. Right. So maybe that's one of the first things that we should do is make sure that the mayor is a bit, is a, aware of this meeting, and is aware of our intent anyway to keep the programs going. See what she thinks, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And make contact. Yeah, with make contact with mayors of our sister cities. Yes. Right. Reiterate uh, right. uh, her relationship. I think, and I think she'd do it, don't you? I would hope so. Yeah. So why can't we do that as a first step? Make a plan to visit her, to request a meeting with her, uh, to talk about what might we do to, re to restart the city. Because truly, they haven't been terrible. I guess you're a Slavo has been, right? Yeah. Good for you. I, I would loop in uh, the, the city council as well. What? Um, city council as well. Loop in city council as well as the mayor. Uh huh. Because um, they work, they'll have to work in coordination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, we, do we do travel? Travels to those countries? We have. Peter and I travel to Israel and Palestine. And the, the travel that has occurred is privately funded. Yeah. Like, even, even as mayor, when I travel to these. Cities, I paid your own way. I paid my own way. Uh, one that you know, two thousand bucks not going to take you very far. But that's that's again one of the challenges that you you face. You mm -hmm. don't want to leave participation in the sister city program as being a privilege that only those that have personal wealth can uh, participate in. But those people with personal wealth can give scholarships. Yes. To others. Right. And there ought to be some strategizing yes, around exactly. uh, fundraising. That. Around but, fundraising. Yeah. That, that, yeah. I think that's why the tax exemption is important. Yeah. Yep. But yeah. they get donations from uh, you know individuals and uh, companies, etc. Mm -hmm. And raise money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. raise but, but that would require an overall. I spoke to Don Higgins. He said that the Nicaragua Nicaragua one was so defunct that he wasn't going to ask for a budget. I said, Dan. Get the damn budget, you know, and right. think about ways to fuel that into all of the sister cities. But isn't the first step to have some kind of a coordinated committee? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then, but then decide if they want to. They would have to start a second organization. Basically. Yeah, that's a, an agglomeration organization. It would seem to me also the first step would be getting a committee to go talk to the mayor. I mean, I'm always interested in first steps right. so that the movement won't die. And there's also a responsibility on the part of uh, the individual sister city yeah. programs to communicate to the city. Uh, yes. You know, for a basis, we had to issue an annual report. Mm -hmm. This is what we've yeah. done in the past year. This is what we plan to do in the future. And I understand through discussions with the mayor's office that not every program is doing that. We do. So if you're involved in a program that is not reporting to the city, you should do so. Mm -hmm. I think and, that ours did that, Paul. Hmm? Ours used to do that. Ours does do that. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We haven't gotten got one for this year because it's not over with yet. We got one from last year. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but anyway, so is there an agreement anyway to have some sort of a coordinated committee? I don't know. Other than having the next meeting and planning to go or planning to go see the mayor as soon as she's available. Right. What do you think? I would think that, uh, yeah, I think each, each in 
the Fiji Vicky or Vicky Vermont Vicky. Institute. And the reason that those words were chosen was because its original name of Burlington College. Right. Yeah. But if Vicky was willing to or organize that, I I think for Vicky to reach out to the individual sister city programs. Uh, Are you willing to do that? I'll do it with you. I'm believing that uh, the number is is six. Now. Do we have our sign-in sheet? With everybody's phone number, we probably should have, right? Okay, I'll go get it. I'll do this. Is there one for Japan? I think there was thoughts of it, but in other words, I don't think no, we have one. We no. don't have one in Asia. Okay. There have been a number of other international initiatives that are, are, are not just a city program per se. And for years, there was an experience exchanges between Burlington and Nishionima, Japan, yeah. focused on environmental education. Mm. So it was very, very focused. But mm. at, time, at one time, there was some funding for those programs. There have also been sister weight programs. Yeah, and in Macedonia, right? Oh. There was an exchange back in the mid-80s between Lake Champ, those responsible for the management of Lake Champlain with uh, Lake Oakrick, which is bound by Macedonia and Albania. That was, oh, wow. I, I visited uh, that region in 1995 for the first time under that pro program. Then also there, there was a relationship between an Indonesian lake and Lake Champlain, Lake Okra. So there, there was <coughs> quite a, an array of, uh, of programs, the sister city programs at Penn Central, but there's been others as, as well. Yeah. But I, I think one of the, the greatest challenges that we face is how do you market the sister city program? How do you make the community aware that these programs exist? And uh, uh, how do you develop strategies of engaging new people in these, ex in these exchanges? Um, and if we don't bring in new people, these programs yeah. Yeah. will not survive. And I think that there are some lessons to be learned. You know, Osler is the most active program yeah. now. Why? What are, they, what are they doing? That, yeah, we wow. can go there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's the big thing. And there's not a war yet. Yes. Right. Yeah. Well, what about the school system as well? We need to teach our youth about that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Some schools have sister school relationships. Um, we were learning that Stephen on our board, uh -huh. who um, teaches at U32, yeah. they've started a sister school relationship with a high school in Nepal, for example. Mm -hmm. So these, mm -hmm. yeah, anyway, just yeah. thinking about schools. But yeah, um, I, well, I, yeah, I gave an example of how we've tried to involve <laughs> high school students. I think that's a great, a great idea. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so this is going around with everybody. And so, Eric, you would like to take charge of at least trying to get in touch with the mayor and setting up a meeting, and then the whole committee could be invited to go, right? Yeah. Would that be okay? So maybe with Valley, uh, we need to go to Africa. But, uh, you know, so maybe we can organize a trip to Senegal. So I think that 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 all right, well, that's the moderator. I'm about ready to uh, yeah. call, it a day. call it a day. And thank you for coming and uh, adjourn this discussion. But I think it's been a good discussion. But yeah. uh, it's, it's uh, valuable being, it will be in the follow up. We're going to yeah. talk to the mayor. But I think it's true um, trips are really, really of important. Course. Mm -hmm. Right. And we can get. Other people to go with scholarships, I think. Yeah. yeah. Right. And but Ali, you think you should go to Senegal? Of course. Oh, yes. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Right.
Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.